The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. This is Mark Olson speaking. Glad to have all of you on board. Water quality is becoming a, well, let's just say, growing interest in the North American market, as evidenced by manufacturers increasingly training on the importance of water quality in maintaining the um, integrity and the performance of systems as well as other manufacturers coming out with uh, water treatment equipment, uh, including uh, probably the, the pinnacle type of treatment called demineralizers. So this is a little bit different, this webinar, than we've done in the past. We've had a couple on water quality. We'll be digging in deeper into the chemical aspects of water, and we sure have learned a lot here at Calafi in the last year since we've launched more and more water quality products, and uh, we're looking to take that learnings uh, to you today in this webinar. Uh, so we're pretty excited and looking at the screen here on those two guys arm wrestling, we can we know which one's going to win, right? Hydronics 19 is the last one and we're working on 20 which will be on documenting hydronic systems. Today we'll draw a little bit from our number 18 issue, water quality in hydronic systems. So these are journals that we send out to the market on our dime every six months, it's our service to the industry, and so if you are a designer or a contractor or other professional and have an interest in receiving these, uh, we send them right to your desk. Contact your rep, your Kalefi rep, or check our website for signing up. Okay, let's get going. Water quality in closed hydronic systems. I'm pretty excited about this. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, and so when I agreed to do this, I thought, okay, I'll get into dusting off biochemistry books and and uh, well, I found out that that onion is, it's like peeling an onion. You peel back one layer and then you got another layer to contend with and figure out what's going on. So that's what's happening in inside of our systems. And I'm gonna try to make heads, I wanna try to make sense of that for you in today's uh, webinar. So let's set the stage. Firstly, just a few months ago, we asked a question in one of these Coffee with Kalepis, when hydronic systems fail, in your experience, how often was fluid quality a probable factor? And you can see the results there. Um, eyeballing it, I would say 50, 60, 70 percent of the time, fluid was a probable factor. And also, down in the bottom, I'm not sure, 8 percent, which indicates there's a, a need for educating the market. And this is a step in that direction. And I hope today's webinar might be the, the, the impetus to start getting some dialogue amongst the industry started including um, folks on this webinar. If you have particular experience having to do with water quality, please uh, please let us know. Also, I forgot to mention, down in your um, comment box there, you'll see uh, you can ask questions as we go along here. I'm going to probably towards the end of this have time to answer some questions. And then we'll vote for the, um, the Kalefi Excellence entries from October. Uh, all of you will select the winner from that group of finalists. Okay, well, what's happened in the last few decades impacting water quality? Well, mechanical appliances, for one, they've got more efficient, thinner heat exchanger walls to improve heat transfer, narrow flow, uh, flow clearances, excuse me, uh, just to name a couple of things. And we do know that, uh, like many aspects of life, scheduled maintenance is not as common as it once was. And then lastly, and not insignificantly, is metal recycling is increasingly practiced. And what this means is manufacturers of equipment, whether it's chillers or boilers or other types of products, um, have an increasingly um, greater amount of recycled materials. Good for us, good for the environment, but from a corrosion standpoint, and we'll get into corrosion, in fact, the, some of the chemical side of corrosion, but um, corrosion at its elemental level is an electrochemical process, and it requires, well, at the micro level, a galvanic cell, basically two different noble materials. And to the extent that a particular piece of, say, aluminum has a little bit of recycled copper, for example, uh, is something that um, the corrosion likes to focus on. And I'm not picking on aluminum, just using it as an example. Water quality here in North America, just choosing uh, randomly some uh, boiler manufacturers and what they indicate in their operating guides as uh, specs to follow for the contractor. There's, it's quite diverse, but they center around total dissolved solids. I'll use my cursor here. Um, total hardness. Basically, they're trying to keep the conductivity of the fluid down 
because conductivity is an ingredient for corrosion, as well as keeping the hardness down so you don't get lime scaling. And there, there's specific requirements such as chlorides and sulfates and other what we'll call anions that can be especially mm, detrimental to certain types of uh, heat exchangers, whether it's stainless steel or aluminum, for example. So if we're designers and we're sitting down to uh, put our design to paper on a hydronic system, our list might be something like this. We want to minimize scale formation on our heat exchangers, and this is design objectives as it relates to water quality. Minimize that scale. Before I go further, even one millimeter of scale buildup on a heat exchanger will penalize the heat transfer efficiency of that heat exchanger by 10%, up to 10%, and that's basically energy going up the chimney or excessive electrical consumption in the case of heat pumps. Minimize corrosion specifically oxidation, oxygen-driven corrosion, as well as galvanic. These two types of corrosions are very related and they're both electrochemical and we'll talk about each of those in detail. And there's other types of corrosion, there's microbial corrosion and, and others, but these are the big guys, assuming you have good water. Minimize sedimentation, so all systems will have some form of oxidation and to the extent that some of that floats around in the sy system, you want to minimize that. And for glycol systems specifically, you want to make sure your fluid quality over time preserves the antifreeze properties of your fluid so you don't end up, for example, with these solar collectors up here bursting as a result of the glycol losing its freeze properties. So those would be perhaps three or four big objectives that the designer would have and his or her solutions would be to do what? Well, manage your air content to the minimum possible. Ingress, which is the influx of air and oxygen specifically in the case of, say, polymers such as PPR piping and high-density uh, high polyethylene used in, in, um, in uh, geothermal systems, uh, et cetera. So because of the advent of these uh, great um, materials, they do come with a little bit more ingress of oxygen into the system. So just make sure you have good ability to expel it by way of high efficient separation devices. Minimize your water conductivity. Conductivity of water is an ingredient, one of the ingredients for the potential corrosion to, uh, to take place. And by minimizing your water conductivity, as you'll see, you also eliminate scale. Keep pH stable. If you reduce your air content to the minimum possible and you basically minimize your water conductivity, pH becomes less of an issue and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, it's not completely gone with these but it is less, lesser of an is issue and it becomes more of, a, more of an indicator of what's happening in your system versus uh, something that is physically controlled with some exceptions. Prevent sedimentation effects, so if you do have debris uh, an example of a solution would be a Y strainer. Been around for a long time, but there's a lot more products out in the marketplace today that allows the designer that if there is any foreign objects in your system, they get collected and don't end up collecting somewhere where they can be detrimental. And then with all of that, then evaluate your chemical additives to consider using for your system. So let's take a look at some corrosion. Here is a example of galvanic corrosion. This is a, looks like a copper T and I'm not quite sure of the metal but it's a dissimilar metal on the scale of nobility of metals from the bronze or uh, I'm, I guess that's bronze and we know this is galvanic corrosion because it has the telltale sign of uh, that oxide kind of creeping up. Okay and the other thing about corrosion is that dissolved oxygen and conductive water are not mutually exclusive. They uh, interact so in order to prevent this corrosion, we could do or minimize it. We could have, number one, reduce our dissolved oxygen, made sure that's low, or made sure our water was not conductive. Either one of those would dramatically minimize either galvanic or oxidation type corrosion. Minimizing both would really go a long way to minimizing corrosion or eliminating it. So with low oxygen and low conductive water, pH becomes less of an issue. However, even with no oxygen, you can get corrosion if you're acidic enough with pH of four or less. That wouldn't happen in a system unless something went awry, such as a chemical that turned acidic, perhaps glycol 
as an example. And we'll talk about glyco, by the way, later in the presentation towards the end. But if you do have conductive water, the pH does take a more important role. And here's an example of how this different types of metals will respond corrosion-wise to pH changes. So we have, as an example in blue, uh, aluminum and copper and other amphoteric metals, as an example. And then ferrous metals, such as steel and iron, shown in orange here. And you can see the happy point of pH is different for those different types of metals. Aluminum, as an example, once you get uh, above 8, as you increase pH, then it starts to quickly increase. And resultingly, many aluminum specs or manufacturers will say, keep the pH below 8.5. Iron and steel has a larger pH range where it's, like it's happy and makers of that type of equipment will typically specify a pH range that will go higher, perhaps to 10 or 10 plus. So those are, those are the, um, uh, how metals will respond in a conductive water environment as pH changes from a corrosion standpoint. Now we've been talking about pH and well, let's just stop here and just talk about what, what pH really means. And it was interesting in, in our research to find out it's a French uh, or origination term, pH, and it means, well, I'm, I'm going to just say it's power of the hydrogen. I don't want to tackle that one. It's the measure of how acidic or basic the fluid is, and it really is a measure of how much concentration of dissolved hydrogen you have in your fluid versus de dissolved hydroxide. And because that range runs so far in, in our natural world, left to right, low to high, it's good like many things in science to look at it from a log standpoint. So it's done in a log basis so that we can get a visual feeling for the relative differences of pH of different fluids. And here's some household items that you'll recognize. Uh, there are different ranges of pH. Seven is neutral. Pure water unaerated, as an example, would be a seven. And a low-end battery acid is very acidic, and bleach and drain cleaner are very caustic or high pH. That would be called base, high base, sometimes called alkalinity, high alkalinity, which causes things to be con confused because there's a difference between pH and alkalinity, which we'll get into a little bit later, and it's an important difference to understand. Now, being an inquisitive guy myself, I was wondering, well, just how accurate are these charts that you see? And I, I drink Coke from time to time, and sometimes it creates a little bit of upset stomach for me, but I still <laughs> drink it. So I had to do a test myself. I, I took a Cleffy pH meter, and I, on my desk, I put uh, a can of Coke, poured it into glass, and sure enough, 2.8 pH. So my uh, curiosity <laughs> was satisfied there. And I did some more experiments, but we'll, we'll save those for another time. Um, Katie, our marketing uh, coordinator, did a fun thing on Facebook and took that corrosion, since we're talking about having our tongue in our cheek right now, <laughs> and put up on Facebook and asked for people to comment on it. And it was very interesting to see what people responded back. Pretty humorous responses, some right on, right on the money, like uh, Mike Lampin up here, galvanic corrosion. But my favorite was here, Robert Eco, I guess. It's alive. <laughs> so uh, you got to have fun, right? Moving back to what's going on uh, as potential problems, limescale formation. It doesn't care whether it's a condensing boiler or some other form of boiler. Limescale can form if given the right conditions and create, well, in this case, failed boilers. An expensive proposition. Here's one a little bit closer to home. Came into Milwaukee, where we're headquartered. Uh, a separator, one of our tanks, it failed, corrosion. You can see the little pinhole. In fact, I'll show that here. And this is the inside, looking inside the flange. Now, a lot of things was going on here. We can tell. We're not quite sure, but um, certainly different things were going on. Not the least to mention is the corrosion took place at the weld joint. And that's another thing about corrosion, whether it's a seam coming together or a welding joint, uh, dissimilar metals of different types, uh, that's where corrosion will concentrate its power at. In fact, we can even see it starting to happen over here. There was some corrosion before this thing broke out right here. Even working brass can cause um, a change in the metal, and that's why brass component manufacturers such as ball valve manufacturers and the like will, will heat treat their products and then anneal them such as Kleppi's caps here shown cooling down after annealing in our factories over in Italy. So what are the 
equipment, uh, available equipment and current practices to the designer in the marketplace today. Well, we're all familiar with these and we won't cover them because uh, we've done them in past webinars. There's the physical water quality solutions and there's chemical water quality solutions. On the physical side, air separators and dirt separators to get rid of air and dirt and even magnetic particles that can wreak havoc like uh, magnetite on our ECM motors. Even purge and uh, purge carts like Kalefi has here and a number of other manufacturers are good solutions to physically address potential problems of water, keeping that water good. But how about chemical? Well, we'll address the rest of this seminar or webinar on chemicals. Uh, it will be interesting for you to see our assessment of what in North America is the treatment practices of systems today. This is in the United States and Canada. And this is input from a number of Kalef coffee with Kalefi poles and other input that we pieced together. But basically, as we see it in North America, about a third of all systems have no treatment. The water is taken from the site, put into the system, good to go. Another third has some chemical of some type added. Okay, it could be glycol, it could be some type of buffering agent or oxidizer or, or what have you. And the other third is kind of equally split, split between systems that get filled with softened water or systems that get filled with demineralized water, what we consider to be the best form of treatment right here. But we'll talk about each of these, by the way. In fact, I'll come back to that slide at the very end of this webinar and uh, summarize some things and also some recommendations. So the chemical behavior of water, let's start with something we may have learned in school, distillation. So we have some flask that has contaminated water, so water with some, in this case, salt. It gets heated, the water vapors, now pure water vapors come up, they condense and end up as a, and they condense back the fluid into a distillate. Distillate, basically, maybe pure water if it's done correctly. So water that, we have available to us on site to fill our hydronic systems. Let's talk about that, but starting off here, where does that water come from? Well, like that experiment, water evaporates from lakes and seas and rivers, even from trees and other fauna. They perspire, creating vapor. The vapor rises up, it condenses into liquid form, comes down to the earth to act, um, become surface water, or even drain into our earth into aquifers to be available for groundwater. Now when that water is coming down, it's going up and, and it's condensing up here and it's pure water, but as it comes down, it doesn't become so pure from the standpoint that I'll show you in just a second. So before it hit the ground and had a chance to get somewhere like a lake or an aquifer, let's say we collected it. And let's say we collected it and stored it in a plastic barrel as you see here, this is actually from our neighbors. Not quite sure what they're using this rainwater for. Perhaps they're watering their plants. That would be my guess. Um, but if you looked at the pH of this water and measured it, and it's because it has a barrel that is basically inert, it's going to be somewhat acidic. Rainwater is typically around 5.6, and that is acidic. And so, for example, you wouldn't want to have a steady stream of this water running through your pipes for potable water use in your home if your pipes were made out of, say, copper. Because over time, that low pH and the high dissolved oxygen in that water could wear away the pipe early on. What happens chemically when that water is dropping out of the sky, it's no longer when it was in those, when it was in the lake, as an example, it was being bound up by uh, buffers, uh, basically we call them carbonates, and, um, but when it evaporates, it becomes pure, and now the water is, is acceptable or hungry for something called carbon dioxide, which is a, the major component of air, right? So carbon dioxide is absorbed by the water, and a chemical reaction happens. Water and carbon dioxide form this thing, carbonic acid, a very weak acid, but an acid nonetheless, probably has a pH itself of around 5, 5 plus. And that carbonic acid by itself will dissociate, it will break down into hydrogen and bicarbonate. Hydrogen, I got it centered here. Remember the definition of pH, a bigger increase of dissolved hydrogen versus hydroxide. And this is the reason why water, when it absorbs carbon dioxide, will drop its pH. We'll come back to this concept when we talk about demineralizers 
later in the presentation. So the water then comes down to the earth and it goes somewhere, either through the earth and, or into surface water. So let's talk about surface water. If you look at the pH of surface water around the world, on average, it ranges between 6.5 and 8.5. That's probably the, let's call it the 95th percentile kind of range, okay? So it's actually pretty tight. Rivers and lakes usually contain reactive minerals, whether it's limestone or some other mineral, and causing the pH to rise back up. And we'll get into the, why that happens, but the pH tends to be somewhat higher on this range when you're talking about surface water. Now, if the water comes down and collects in, say, a reservoir surrounded by very few reactive minerals, for, for instance, uh, granite, um, your pH then will tend to be closer to the rain, so lower, less than 6.5. And if acid rain is present, for example, uh, sulfur from automotive or industrial um, exhaust, you could have an even lower pH. I was traveling with uh, one of our folks out in British Columbia um, a few years, years ago, and one of the engineers out there talked about in that particular BC, their water was uh, acidic, their potable water was acidic, and perhaps the source of that water might be something like this. And as a result, he talked about how uh, I think it was uh, more and more polymer-based plumbing becoming uh, commonplace versus metal-based plumbing. Groundwater, on the other hand, tends to have a pH that runs a little bit lower, 6.0 to 8.5, but a fairly tight range. And if we showed an example of a, a well drawing from a aquifer, a groundwater aquifer, it might look something like this. And if we were to put a hydronic system in this home, and then fill the system up with water from this system here, it's a good chance that we would have a large amount of dissolved minerals, that water would be conductive, and if this was limestone down here, it would also be hard as well, two problems, but not necessarily. Why? Well, it all depends on where that water is being drawn from. Ground substrates influence dissolved minerals substantially if your water is being drawn from sand and gravel and other silica-based type materials, you're going to have potentially much lower dissolved solids. And if it's coming from limestone, as an example, or, li or other similar type of um, stone, higher dissolved solids. Now, all groundwater is really local, even though you might look at a map of North America and think otherwise. Here, actually, was a, it's a Kalefi map of the mapping of water hardness ranges in, in, at a very macro level. So if you looked at this, you might say, oh, um, let's pick Iowa here. You might say Iowa is all extremely hard water. Well, that's not the case. There's a lot of hard water in Iowa. There's also some water that isn't so hard. I lived in southwest Michigan for 17 years. Let's blow that up. And over here where the arrow is, the right part of the arrow is where I lived, and I'll tell you, our water was really hard. Our water softener, we used a lot of salt. And friends of mine, just 15, 20 minutes west towards the surface water of Lake Michigan, also drawing from well water, had fairly soft water. Didn't require a water softener, for example. So water can change dramatically, even from neighborhood to neighborhood. I learned that uh, back at uh, Penn Terre when I used to work in the water treatment area. So. Minerals dissolving in water, what's going on? We talked about how, how it happens. What, what happens when the minerals dissolve? Well, let's take a mineral that we're very familiar with, table salt. By the way, I like this uh, salt shaker. Um, I, I use a lot of salt. <laughs> and it's kind of embarrassing when I go to a restaurant because I always keep the salt shaker by me because those restaurant salt shakers, you got to work hard just to get a few grains out of them. <laughs> So uh, this is my type of salt shaker. Anyway, let's get back to our content here. So salt is sodium chloride. And if you look at the molecule, it's like this. Chloride and sodium all bound together tightly. And the electrical neutrality is in place. There's no charge on this, even though each of the molecules has its own charge. It's electrically neutral. But that changes when we put it in water. We're going to put it in water. And a water molecule looks like this, oxygen two hydrogens, H2O, right? So we're going to put it in and see what happens. But by the way, I'm not. let me point out something. See the hydrogen here? It's small, physically small, in relation to the oxygen. And at its most elemental level, the smallness of hydrogen 
is really what causes in a, in a hydronic system reaction with metals. And it's powerful, very strong. Hydrogen is a strong, think of a uh, hydrogen, uh, 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 hydro, hydrogen atom, uh, hydrogen bomb as an example, if you want to think about its potential. Anyway, let's put this salt in water and see what happens. So we're going to put salt in the water. And what happens is the salt starts off in solid form and the water starts doing its trick. The great dissolver, right, water, and it starts pulling away sodium and chloride to the point where it's homogeneous and now it's completely in solution. And what we've done in doing this chemically, we've taken a solid sodium chloride, put it in water, and the result was an aqueous sodium cation, that's the plus, an ion that's positively charged is cation, and a chloride negatively charged ion called an anion. Now this is salt, which is a mineral, but you're not going to find that typically in a hydronic system, right? We'll get into that in a second, but since we've now have dissolved our salt, those ions are now making the water highly conductive and capable of causing corrosion. But minerals that are more common and would could find their way into a hydronic system, you'll know them as calcite, and magnesite, and gypsum, uh, dolomite, calcium carbonate, etc. These are just examples of mineral compounds that when water dissolves them, they go into solution as ions. Also metals, metals are minerals, iron, iron, manganese, these will also disasso dissociate into water and break down and form ions. An example of this conductive quality of dissolved minerals is exhibited here by our friend Jeff Persons at Geosource One who did a webinar with us a couple of years ago. He took a multimeter, took a beaker, placed tap water, just opened up the faucet, placed tap water in there, and on his leads put a penny, a copper penny, and a uh, galvanized nail. Copper and galvanized nails are very separate, dissimilar, different electromotive potentials between those two put them in the water and what happens? Put it on voltage, you can see it drew a voltage of 0.875. That's what happens. If he were to click his multimeter over to current, he also would see a small current. We have set up basically a battery effect here. So measuring conductivity is actually a good approximation for how many minerals are dissolved in our water. And it's a lot easier than trying to say take your water sample and uh, heat it up, evaporate all the water and measure the remaining solids, uh, measuring, getting your total dissolved solids. Uh, instead, conductivity is a very well accepted form of measuring your total dissolved solids. And by the way, total dissolved solids is really meaning total dissolved minerals that go in the solution creating electrical current. So that's what we're really doing and that's what boiler specs are looking for is they're really looking for those minerals that go in this, and most natural inorganic minerals that dissolve form ions, almost all of them. So the relationship between conductivity versus TDS looks something like this. Conductivity often is measured in microsiemens per centimeter, and that converts to parts per million dissolved in water, in, in called TDS. And we can see our range here. At top here we see ultra pure water, very unconductive, very low parts per million. Moving up, if we treat that, if we treat water with demineralized ion exchange or RO water or even distilled water, it's going to be at a, at a very low range. But water that comes out of the tap, around the United States anyway, averages between 140 and 400 parts per million. Now there are outliers. Interesting, in New York City, 34 parts per million. New York City has fantastic water right out of the tap, on average. Once we were visiting our rep out in New York, Don Rath, and I remember him one time saying, early on, he said, New York City has the best water in the world, and I thought he was joking. I almost started laughing. Well, he's probably right, or pretty close to right. On the other extreme, places like Lafayette, Indiana, 450. Uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin, 475, I think, something along those lines. Very high in TDS. 
the EPA drinking limit, by the way, is at 500 that the municipalities have to limit water TDS to. So to give you an idea of what this means in terms of dissolved solids, whether it's calcium or magnesium or whatever in your water, take aspirin. You know aspirin, five grains, and one grain, of, one grain per gallon of water is equivalent to 17.1 parts per million. So if you took that aspirin tablet and put it a, in a one gallon bucket of water, it, it would be the equivalent of 85 parts per million. So that would mean New York City would be about a third of an aspirin in that gallon, and Lafayette, Indiana would be, what, uh, five, something like that, just to try to put dissolved solids into some perspective for you. Now measuring PDS, there's many on the market. Here's Cleffy's TDS, and like that multimeter, there are leads. This is measuring conductivity between the leads, but also measuring temperature of the water. We'll get into that in a second. This one also measures pH, by the way. It's important, heat increases water's conductivity. So for example, we're reading uh, 193 here at 76 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? If we heated this water up to say 85 degrees, we might get a reading of quick of 200 and some parts per million. That would be an error because we didn't add any more solids to our water. It's just being affected by temperature, okay? Now, fortunately, the Kalefi uh, sensors are temperature compensated and they automatically um, adjust, but others might not. So keep that in mind when you look at measuring conductivity and translate it into total dissolved solids. And before we leave temperature, for every 10, 20 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature in a hydronic system, the corro corrosion potential doubles. So that's not insignificant. What that means too is that chilled water systems, typically corrosion, corrosion is much less of an issue compared to hydronic heating systems. And also is a reason why you can have much higher pipe velocities, as an example, in chilled water systems because you have less chance for erosion corrosion to take place because you don't have much erosion that you wipe off by high current or high velocity to begin with. And uh, also, of course, we all know that high pipe velocity is, uh, as an example, um, in chilled water systems uh, is good for the efficiency of the, of the chiller as well as keeping humidity control under wraps. Anyway, I digress, keep going. Um, so we, up until now, we've been talking about dissolved minerals in water that are inorganic. They're basically found in the earth. But how about organic minerals? Well, here's one, sugar. We're all familiar with that. It dissolves in water, but it doesn't ionize. It doesn't break up into electrical, electrically charged ions. And as a result, you would not be able to measure it on a, on, on a, on a meter. Now, we're not going to have sugar in our hydronic system, but we might have perhaps these type of chemicals, perhaps. And some chemical additive, additive manufacturers do have organic chemicals that go into their product. So it's something just to keep in mind. So let's now go into a hydronic system and let's just take this one just for example. And where the red is, is where we're going to break into that pipe. And let's just pretend, I'm just noticing this is a glycol system, but let's pretend this is just a water-based a water -based system. Let's go into the pipe and we're going to start and pretend like inside of here is perfectly pure water. So we're breaking into the pipe and we have perfectly pure water. And let's put this on the next slide here. So we know that that water has is basically molecules floating around all tightly bound together. And to simplify the visual representation, we'll, we'll show as such. Okay. Now, is, does water ever exist in this state? Question for you. No, because water always wants to dissociate to some degree its molecules, meaning the H2O, the hydrogen, always wants to break off. And when it does, it forms a hydrogen molecule and leaves a hydroxide molecule. And this is in balance. So they, they break apart, they form, they break apart. It's in equilibrium. That's what pure water will do. And if we take that and measure the conductivity, it would be something like this. Not quite zero, right? And that's because we have some ionic activity even with pure water. But it's pretty close to zero, as we showed on a previous slide, it's 0.05 microsiemens per centimeter. And if we measured the pH, 
at 25 degrees Celsius, it would be 7. That's the definition of uh, uh, pH neutral 7. Now, going back to here, okay, what happens then when our hydrogen and hydroxide gets out of whack? Starting with our hydrogen concentration is greater than our hydrogen hydroxide concentration, as evidenced here, all these hydrogen in solution. That would make the water be basic, uh, acidic. And if the con other conditions are, are such that in your hydronic system, they can cause corrosion. On the other side is hydrogen concentration less than hydroxide concentration. You see it here. In that case, our water then would be more basic, depending on the ratio of the ions, both hydrogen and hydroxide. And if we have magnesium and calcium in our water, that could favor, with basic water, scale buildup. Now, if you're a chemist and you're looking at this, and by the way, I know there's probably some technical mm, abnormalities in the eyes of maybe a chemical engineer or a chemist here, but I, my, my, my aim is to be, uh, at the end of this, uh, an A minus in your eyes and an A for everybody else. <laughs> so, but maybe if you're a chemist, you might say, what, well, wait a second, something's wrong, and you're right. The electrical neutrality has to be honored. Our positives and negatives have to be balanced. Otherwise, if you touch water, you could do what? You could get a shock if you're grounded. All right? So let's see a more typical example of what we'd have in a hydronic system, and that would look like this. Water that has a lot of ions in solution of different types, depending on the water quality, and it could be phosphates and chlorides and potassium and sodium. You can see them all here. And you see some question marks here. Negative. Those are negative ions I'm going to talk about. Now let's just pretend all of our cations here, our negative ions, are non-carbonate. They're not carbonate or bicarbonate based. And I'll talk about what that means. But if they if our water doesn't have carbonate based anions, that water is low in alkalinity. What's the significance of that? Well, when we have water that's low in alkalinity, it's subjective to wide swings in pH. That's why chemical manufacturers have products that are alkaline buffers. They're basically buffering the chance that pH can change. So if we were to start off with a pH of 7 as an example, and in our water, remember a Coke can and dump Coke in here, for example, afterwards we would see that we could have wide swings in our resulting pH towards the acidic side or we could dump bleach in, in which case we would have swings towards the basic side. Okay, So low alkaline water or low alkalinity water basically does not buffer the water from changes in pH if something changes in the system. Now if those question marks up here are carbonate based anions, carbonate and bicarbonate for example, it becomes highly alka uh, high alkalinity water. And if we repeated our experiment again with our Coke, we would see that the change in pH would be minimized or maybe even almost prevented. And the change in pH as a result of something caustic going in also would be minimized. So it's important to understand the difference between pH and alkalinity. And some of the confusion is sometimes high pH is called high alkaline or alka high alkalinity. <laughs> it should be more, more basic and more acidic rather than the word acidity or alkalinity being mentioned with um, pH. So corrosion, very important. So let's look at chemically what's happening with corrosion. Let's take an iron pipe as an example and we have conductive water. And let's look at a very small place where the water and the pipe come together. In fact, probably a million times smaller than what I'm showing here. It would look like something like this. Somewhere, everywhere, we have a difference in concentration between our dissolved oxygen, here high dissolved, low dissolved. That's a battery cell, and there becomes a magnetic difference, more cathodic over here, anodic over here. And with conductive water, and a metal that can give up ions or give up electrons, we have the makings of corrosion. Now, could this happen without oxygen? Sure. We could have the same thing happen with dissimilar metals being joined together, perhaps copper and steel, for example. Okay, so that also could create 
the basis of corrosion to take place where the steel will lose material in exchange for some oxide or some other reaction creating a substance somewhere in the system. So back to our case though, on oxygen and iron, just to be consistent, what happens is this, and it's different depending on how much oxygen you have in your system. So let's start off with water with dissolved oxygen, a fair amount, let's just say. What will happen is this, our anode loses material and, and, the, and the result is something that's called ferrous oxide. And the simultaneous equations that are set off by the dissolved oxygen creating this whole situation is here. I won't go through all of them, but basically we have electrons flowing through a metal and we have ions going into solution, iron turning into Fe2 and hydroxide being formed over here. Those come together and react again to form ferrous hydroxide, but we're not done. We continue. Ferrous hydroxide reacts with oxygen to, to create iron oxide. In this form, it's called hematite. It might even be a wet form of hematite, Fe2O3H2O, a less stable form of hematite, even though hematite by itself isn't so stable. In fact, the qualities of hematite, it's unstable. It's loose. It loosely adheres to the metal. It has poor heat transfer property, and it's fairly easily washed away, exposing more metal to more corrosion and more pitting. And lastly, it does settle out in low velocity areas, such as a boiler or a separator or a buffer tank, wherever the velocity slows down, okay, hematite. And when it's done corroding, it looks something like this, okay. Now, before I leave this, what's happened in this process? The mere act of corrosion has done what? The oxygen that was in solution consumes the oxygen, or the corrosion consumes it. And so we deplete our oxygen by way of corrosion. This is one example how systems will self-stabilize on their own, but in this case, at the expense of some corrosion taking place. Now, let's jump over to our other example of water with low or no dissolved oxygen. So if we, have, if we have low initial dissolved oxygen, something happens a little different. Our ferrous oxide over here goes directly into a different form of um, a ferrous hydroxide, into a different form of ferrous oxide. That's called hematite. And the oxidizing agent is the water itself with the ferrous hydroxide. Resultingly, the layer that's created is very stable. It's tightly adhering. It has excellent heat transfer property, and it protects from further corrosion. And it can be washed away if there's excessive fluid velocity, if the pH drifts too high or low, or if, our, um, if we have fluid conductivity or dissolved oxygen, it, it gets out of whack. Typically, what will happen, though, if we is another example, is if after we have started corroding hematite, driven off our oxygen by way of heating the water and our air separators doing their job, the water's driven off. And what happens is our hematite starts to convert over to magnetite. And the layers closest to the water might wash away. Those are the unstable labor layers. And the remaining layers would be tightly adhering to the remaining uh, metal. Okay, so let's take a look at magnetite in action. Here's some excessive magnetite that was captured by the Kalefi magnetic dirt separator being blown down by this contractor to keep that magnetite from causing problems somewhere else in the system. And hematite, some examples of uh, boiler systems with uh, being purged out, we can see hematite has a red effect typically to it. And this failed boiler over here has it dried up. It's uh, residue effort failed. You can see the remnants of hematite. Other metals have similar reactions. Stainless steel forms chromium oxide, a very durable layer, protective layer, copper oxide, aluminum oxide. And you can see very thin. This is three microns, and probably that thickness is maybe, if you eyeball it, what? One micron, one and a half. Now, some manufacturers of stainless steel heat exchangers will, will accelerate the protection process by in the factory passivating the stainless steel with, say, perhaps an acid 
that leaches away the ferrous surface layer of the stainless steel, leaving a very, very durable um, layer for corrosion protection. And other manufacturers of copper and aluminum might do the same thing too. Well, with that corrosion understood, we now need to talk about dielectrics because, after all, our hydronic systems are components that get put together by, and by connected by uh, seals and um, the like. Here's an example. It's a flanged separator, steel, connected to a copper uh, flange, and our dielectric is in the middle called our gasket. So if we took a look at something like this, it would be our copper and our steel. And let's take a look inside and what's happening from a corrosion or a potential corrosion standpoint. Here it is. Here's our gasket. Here's our bolt. Here's our copper over here. And here's our steel. Let's assume that we have conductive water, which makes the ability for ions to be formed. OK, that part of the equation is solved. But how about down here with electrons? Electrons would have to travel through the flange, out of the flange, into the bolt, across the bolt, and into the other flange, and back again. A very high resistant circuit. Resultingly, this form of dielectric is very effective in a hydronic system to prevent corrosion between dissimilar metals. Conversely, though, in a plumbing system, dielectrics take on a little bit of a different role. Why? Well, in plumbing systems, you typically have what? High dissolved oxygen. It's an open system. Many times high conductivity, because it's an open system. And also, as in the case of this hot water heater, very high temperature water. And remember my statement about corrosion is a function of water temperature, right? In this case, the dielectrics take on a little bit of a different form. The copper, which is dissimilar to the galvanized nipple here is separated and completely with no metal to metal contact. So there is no ability for completing the electron circuit in this case because we have a lot of potential corrosion that could take place otherwise. Now some plumbers might say instead of doing this they might instead of using dielectrics like this unions they might separate the copper from the nipple with perhaps a brass transition fitting. And that could work depending on your water. And, and, and so uh, there are more than one method to create dielectrics, if you will, in systems. So let's take a look at scale. If you take a water drop, it has contaminants in it. You might have cations, potassium, manganese, zinc, iron, calcium, etc. You have anions of all types. I'll point out these guys over here, manganese, zinc, and iron. This would be considered permanent hardness contributors. Permanent. They're hardness because like other hardness contributors, like magnesium, uh, calcium and magnesium, um, you might have a hard time getting the, uh, your shampoo to lather up in your hair or your dishes to wash with uh, good sud sudsing action and things of this nature. But they're permanent in, in the standpoint that once heated, they don't come out of solution very easily. They stay highly soluble. By comparison, calcium and magnesium are just the opposite. The hotter they get, the more they can come out of solution. But they don't do it on their own. Bicarbonate plays a role, and so does dissolved carbon dioxide. Because what happens is a chemical reaction, like we saw in our rainwater, we produce carbonic acid when H2O and CO2 react. The carbonic acid then um, washes across the limestone. Calcium carbonate enters into your system as calcium bicarbonate. That's going into your well or your or your water supply. And the calcium carbonate, once heated, reverts back to bi uh, carbonic acid and calcium carbonate in the form of that guy right there. So that is what's going on when you're causing uh, hard water to come out of solution and that's why boiler manufacturers and chiller manufacturers and other guys will want to make sure that that's held to a minimum. Now we know what this looks like in everyday life. You can take a hard water, boil it down and it will have lime scale deposits and that same material would be used if you take supplements for calcium as an example, the same type of matter. Let's take a look at scaling 
and we have now water that has magnesium and calcium and just say sodium. We're going to talk about how these behave differently and then we're going to get into softening and demineralizing here in just a second. But scaling. Let's say our starting point for conductivity is highly conductive because we got these in solution. Uh, let's say it's alkaline uh, water and a, and a pH of neutral. And let's say we take a match or a lighter and we heat that. And as that water goes over that hot spot, what happens? Take a look at the magnesium and calcium. They start coming out of solution and forming a solid as we showed in that chemistry equation in the earlier slide. And what's happening over here? The conductivity is going down, so is the alkalinity. So basically, the act of limescale buildup does reduce conductivity, another example of how systems like to self-stabilize. Now, a better way of getting rid of limestone, of course, is to treat it. So here's one way, using softening. There's a water softener right here. Happens to be in my mechanical room. And before you start picking the plumbing apart, I'll keep moving. <laughs> so the behavior of softening, so we're going to take our same example here. All right, now we're going to soften this water here rather than put a match to it and see what happens. Let's say our starting point for conductivity is over here, alkalinity here, pH there. So our water softener comes in here, and what happens is our magnesium and calcium gets pulled in and exchanged for sodium. So now we have increased the sodium level of our water as we've gotten rid of the hardness, if you will. And look at our meters. Our, in, our conductivity has increased. Our alkalinity has stays unchanged and our pH stays unchanged. Why did the conductivity go up? We'll show that here in just a second. And if we took away the water softener and heated it, nothing would happen in terms of scaling because there's nothing to scale, nothing left. What's going on in your water softener? Well, there's a resin column. These are filled with resin beads. These are sodium saturated cation beads, cation being positive, remember. And if you took one apart, very porous. In fact, the surface area of the inside of the bead is significantly, significantly higher than the surface area of the outside of the bead. And you look at it from a micro level. So it has the ability to hold a lot of sodium. And so those sodium resin beads then, when the water goes through the beads, the calcium and magnesium get attracted to them and the sodium kicks off. Resultingly, you get rid of your hardness at the expense of sodium going into your water. Now, I mentioned that conductivity goes up. Well, for notice the these are bivalent uh, ions, Mg2, Ca2, and Na1. So really, to simplify things, for every magnesium ion that comes in or calcium ion that comes in, you kick off two sodium. And because of the different differences in conductivity between those two types of molecules, you change your um, conductivity. Now, sodium is a relatively weak cation for beads. It's poor at removing anything other than calcium and magnesium. You can remove some iron and manganese, but they're more effectively used, uh, removed by using a bead that's charged with potassium instead of sodium, for example. Also, keep in mind, when you soften any contaminants such as chlorides and sulfates and nitrates that might be in your water pass right through, and also bicarbonates. That becomes important on this slide. So caution with water softening in systems, hydronic heating systems, why? And I'm going to kind of, I'm going to go a little bit quicker through here and just because I'm a little bit behind on time, just say basically sodium hydroxide forms, all right, which is uh, very basic and your pH can rise above 10. You have increased your hydrogen, con uh, you have, I'm sorry, decreased your hydrogen in solution concentration and increased your hydroxide, thus your pH rising. Okay, so in the case of softening water in a system, uh, in a hydronic system, monitor your pH and consider dosing with a pH reducer and or a chemical corrosion inhibitor. And that would be especially true if you have aluminum components in your system. And the chemical treatment experts out there would be happy to help uh, explain that a little bit better. Site source water, we'll jump to demineralizing now. Instead of water softening using ion exchange, we're going to demineralize using the same process of ion exchange, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. Here's Hot Rod. Doesn't he have the coolest tattoos in the world there? <laughs> that wasn't photoshopped on, by the way. Um, so he's filling up this system with treated water, 
and it looks like this. Water from the tap comes into the bottom of the column, goes up, and it goes into the system. And once the resin beads are spent, they can, been, they can then be recycled. Also available in the marketplace for quite some time has deionized water delivered by your local provider, such as courtesy done here by PureTech Industrial Water. But demineralizer beads are a little bit different because there's what? There's two of them. It's called mixed bed, cation. H plus and anion OH minus. They're loaded and this is the size of them, pretty tiny. So what happens here chemically, we have our contaminated water with anions and cations. Our cation resin bead now charged with hydrogen, remember, not sodium like in softening, but hydrogen, very powerful anion. And over here a very powerful anion, uh, cation, and here anion hydroxide. So the, hydrox the hydroxide bead does its job in bringing in contaminants such as chlorides and phosphates, um, nitrates, um, sulfur. Over here, calcium and magnesium, iron, uh, examples, manganese, potassium, sodium, they all get collected here. Resultingly, what happens as these hydrogen and hydroxide ions get kicked off, Remember, water always wants to reach an equilibrium. They quickly form back together into what? Water. It results in pure water, demineralized water, and the electrical conductivity becomes extremely minimized. So a graphical depiction of the same process here, shown here. We have water going into our system, filling our system. As we pushed all the air out, Demineralized water starts going in our bucket, we get rid of all the air, and then now we have a system filled with demineralized water. But we we'll want to do a check on the pH here, because why? Can pH become lowered as a result of demineralizing? Let's say we had 8.5 pH going in. Yes, in fact, coming out will probably be something closer to 7 before it gets into the system, all right? But your TDS will be also very extremely low, but your pH is around 7. It can become lowered, yes, but it's temporary. How far can it lower? Well, it depends on how long the demineralized water has a chance to react with the air that's in the system that it's displacing. If it gets pushed out the air real quickly, that water has minimal amount of time to have carbonic acid form. But if it takes a long time, it'd be like rain, where it would become more acidic. Our testing indicates from uh, real examples that the pH could go down to maybe 6. But let's take a look at what's happening. As in the rain barrel, all right, we're forming carbonic acid, which breaks down, and here's our contributor to our lowered pH, right? But the system comes online, and what happens over time when the system comes online and we heat the water? And I probably don't have my equation perfectly well here, but basically a couple reactions happen our carbonic acid reacts with our water and oxygen and heat to form bicarbonate. Hydrogen gets driven out of solution. And concurrent with this is another reaction that ends up increasing our hydroxide count. Now, there's probably more to this that happens, but this is really, as I understand reading literature, is what really takes place to cause once our pH has dropped to actually come right back up again. In fact, experience shows that the pH will come up not only to 7, but a lot of times past 7. In fact, maybe 8.2. You can read that in various literature out in the marketplace, called, and that process is called stabilizing. Before we go, you might say, OK, the TDS, though, comes around as very low. In fact, it's zero going in, because the demineralizer is stripping all the ions out, right? And that's true, and the question might be, well, how about low water cutoffs? They work on conductivity. Well, we tested them, and they all tested around 10 TDS is where they start working properly at. But in our case, as we've tested systems, we fill it up with demineralized water. Because the system water reacts pretty quickly to the metals in the system, the TDS actually rises pretty quickly to somewhere north of 10, and as a result, the low water cutoffs work just fine. We have had a couple examples of phone calls coming in 
and uh, in that case someone wanted to start up the system before the TDS had a chance to come up uh, and our solution there is basically probably just add some tap water you're, you're going to be okay and it doesn't take much and you get the TDS up over 10. So the behavior of demineralized hydronic system is this oxygen assuming that your dissolved oxygen and your concentration of carbon dioxide is kept low I mean, that's good air separation right and you have no influences from chemical additives and you have no com compromised componentry like for example a weakened component from a retrofit in that case the pH will eventually stabilize some have referred in the industry to this as self alkalinizing which is a little bit confusing but I like to use stabilize and 8.2 is a cited example of where pH will actually stabilize to in a typical hydronic heating system maybe it's it's fluid temperature dependent on exactly where that ends up at and conductivity stabilizes to somewhere between 50 and 100 microsiemens per centimeter and converted to uh, TDS that would be about 32 to 65 parts per million so our recommendation as in our operating instructions of demineralizers after filling commission the system soon after but monitor the pH it should stabilize within days to a few weeks and then if there are any specific water quality requirements of the heat appliance manufacturer, say the boiler, that's different, make sure you abide by them. But typically they're worried about conductivity and lime scale and contaminants such as chlorides. If you do add chemicals, make sure you do it right or consult the manufacturer. Glycol systems. We're coming down the home stretch. I'm probably going to go to about 15 more minutes and I'll also talk about what's happening over in Europe just to let you know what's in front of you here because we've gone past the hour. We'll have some questions and then we'll do the voting on Calefi Excellence. Glycol systems. A question or a poll came up that we did not too long ago. When you design, install a system, how many are set up with an antifreeze solution throughout the system? Surprising results. Pretty high. You may eyeball that as 30% maybe if you averaged all that. I would say that probably is a little bit biased high, maybe because of the audience that responded to a coffee with Kalefi. But uh, regardless, it's a pretty high number here in North America anyway. By the way, that contrasts with Europe, which has very little glycol systems from our research with our colleagues over there. But it's a big part of the hydronic business over here. They're used in solar and or uh, glycol is used in solar and geothermal applications um, and, and others including just a straight hydronic system. Back to our photograph that we used earlier. There our friends at Axiom, there's their pump glycol uh, system there. Uh, might even be using Clefi um, propylene glycol. Don't know. Also glycol used in geothermal systems. Here's the inside of a mechanical room where the geothermal loops have been brought into the building and manifolded on the Clefi geothermal manifold. But high density polyethylene is non-oxygen barrier so you will get some migration of oxygen just got to account for that make sure you have good air separation and here's a horizontal field a link a slinky field here just for example on a typical geothermal system also solar thermal something unique about solar thermal pump glycol solar thermal systems is if you get stagnation in your collector meaning the temperature of the fluid glycol fluid in your collector it could rise to the point it vaporizes and go from a liquid state to a vapor state cool down to a liquid back to a vapor that's okay but over repeated cycles of that hundreds I don't know you can't really say quantify what, how many but it, eventually it will degrade the properties of the glycol so it's something to be careful in pump glycol systems is to monitor that glycol used in solar systems. Our friend Jeff Person also did a nice experiment that really shows how dissolved minerals are detrimental to glycol. You want, when you use glycol, make sure you use demineralized water, not water that has any sort of dissolved minerals in it. Here's an experiment where he took 80% demineralized water, combined it with 20% propylene glycol, put it in a beaker, airtight, and six months later, basically this is what you saw, no, no signs of deterioration. And then conversely, the same experiment, again, 20% propylene glycol, but this time with well water. 
and six months later is the photo that you see, the steel wool is corroded and the inhibitor has precipitated out. Now this glycol has a much um, higher freeze point and it's probably lost a lot of its properties. In fact, it has. So for glycol systems, a pH meter, just to check pH as an early indicator of how the glycol is doing is a good idea. Uh, some like to use a refractometer tester that basically measures, amongst other things, uh, the freeze point properties of glycol. So I mentioned Europe. What about Europe? Boiler shipments. There's a lot of hydronics in Europe, right? I mean, Spain, over 300,000 units shipped. And these are our estimates, by the way. France, up over close to 800. Uh, United Kingdom, almost, uh, well, 1.8 million. They are the king of hydronics, United Kingdom, when it comes to boiler shipments. And resultingly, and probably not surprisingly, there's a number of standards in place addressing water quality in hydronic systems over in many countries in Europe. The British, the Swiss, the Austrian, the Germans, the, the, the British, um, I'm sorry, um, the Swiss, the Austrian, and the Germans are very similar standards, by the way, in terms of what they call for. If you had to summarize what they call for, there's a very heavy focus on high initial water quality, high, initial, high system design practices, little preference, curiously, on chemical additives. I would have to say they dissuade from using chemicals. Now, they don't have many glycol systems, as an example, and many times we add chemicals to keep our glycol healthy right here in North America. If you took the German standard, BDI, it actually has two parts. It's interesting for North Americans to take a look at what they see. Part one is prevention of scale, and they do this. It depends on how much capacity your boiler or your heat plant is. So basically, curiously, less than 170,000 BTUs per hour type system, no requirements. But as that system gets bigger, look what happens to the hardness requirements. 200 parts per million for something under 700,000. But when you get the 2 million BTUs, you can't accomplish that unless you demineralize the water. Interesting. The other thing too, on their part two prevention of corrosion, they break it up into low dissolved minerals and high dissolved minerals. So as an example, if your hydronic system has a conductivity of the fluid of less than 100 microsiemens per second, they have one level and high dissolved minerals another level. And also curiously, aluminum is a very tight band, 8.2 to 8.5 concerning the pH value, whereas uh, otherwise it's 8.2 to 10, okay? I wanna point out these guys down here, the oxygen content. Back to my earlier point about oxygen and conductivity being related uh, and not mutually exclusive, uh, the Germans make uh, use of that fact. In fact, they, as an example, if you go back to our 0.1 here, 0.10 milligrams per liter, when you have low conductivity and you tolerate you have to have a much lower oxygen concentration if you have higher conductivity as reflected in this chart here. So at 64 parts per million, which is a, a value that most hydronic systems will eventually stabilize to, oxygen content could be much more liberal, 0.1 parts per million, 128, 0.06, and then back to, remember Lafayette, Indiana, 448, well, if you're gonna put that in your system, you better have pretty much no oxygen, and that's almost impossible to, to, uh, to, to take place. So oxygen and conductivity are intricately related. The lesson, ensure your oxygen ingress is offset with efficient air elimination. Keep those devices working efficiently. So if anything's coming in, you wanna get it out. So a wrap up summary. If you're treating your water, make sure it doesn't have any suspended matter. Turbidity, as an example, no biological growth. No, I said if you're not treating your water. Low dissolved mineral content, and that's assuming you don't have freezing as an issue. Then it's okay, like the New Yorkers. If you're adding chemicals, oxygen scavengers, we'd rather have high efficiency air separators, quite frankly, instead of oxygen scavengers be used, you know, not air scoops, but coalescing air separators. Inhibit the scale formation. There's scale inhibitors that basically sequester 
calcium and magnesium. Uh, these can uh, come out of solution and form kind of a uh, particulate that settles out, maybe some people call it a sludge or, or, or actually a residue, a sedimentation. Uh, just be mindful of that. Corrosion inhibitors uh, are a really pretty and amazing uh, chemical. Um, I liken them to, say, uh, taking your pliers that has a red insulator and you're touching low voltage wiring, your red insulator will protect you from any type of shock. And I think inhibit corrosion inhibitors have that same kind of quality, but if you increase your voltage, meaning increase your oxygen and your conductivity, then their effectiveness starts to be impacted. They also have a pretty cool, as I understand it, property that if your metals before you treat have some type of oxide layer, and most do, they have the quality of like WD-40. They have a way of getting through that to the metal surface and coating it. It's not a oxidation coating. It's a it's a uh, molecular coating that is uh, well. It might even be similar to WD-40. I actually haven't seen it, uh, admittedly. Adjust pH, stabilize pH, prevent freezing. All things that can be done in adding chemicals. Ion exchange. Be careful with that pH. Make sure if it does come up and you're using aluminum, uh, you might want to treat that water. And lastly, demineralizing water we feel is the best form of treatment. There's more and more manufacturers coming out with demineralizers. I'll say them right now. Calefi, of course, our friends over at Axiom. I know Watts Water has one. I think Romar has one, and I probably missed a whole bunch. They have demineralizers that use ion exchange. Reverse osmosis and distillation, those are probably more expensive to effectively use in hydronic application. I want to acknowledge thanks to a few folks that are always got readiness to answer our questions kind of uh, outside uh, advisors, Jim Paling over at First Supply, John Bergman and Joe Mandera over at Aries Filter Works. These guys are excellent out in New Jersey. And Jeff Person, our friend at Geosource One out of Columbus, Ohio. So thanks, you guys. And with all that, I'm going to take a big, deep breath. It's quarter after. We have 15 minutes. And I'd like to see if uh, there's any questions. So I'm going to turn it over and see if, uh, if Rex, if you get any questions that have been coming in. Yeah, uh, very nice job, um, <clears throat> Mark. Uh, simulated a lot of uh, questions, and like you said, there's there's quite a few questions, and we can't get them to to them all right now. But um, there's a couple of questions that um, came to the top that um, maybe you could answer. Um, do demineralizers remove polyphosphates from uh, city water? Polyphosphates added by municipalities. Uh, are, I believe, used to, well, it addresses the iron and manganese that might be in solution, especially if they're drawing, if that municipality is drawing from a, an aquifer. Um, and so rather than let that uh, dismay the, their consumers that would have that come out of solution and stain their bathtub and the like, there isn't any, uh, as I understand it, health-related issues with consuming that, but there's definitely an aesthetic. And so um, those polyphosphates are actually a, a complex molecule but they are ionic, and those the polyphosphates themselves will get taken out of by a demineralizer. But uh, to the extent that they um, react and do their job in sequestering manganese and, and um, iron, uh, that particular result uh, probably would not get taken out by our demineralizer, or anyone's demineralizer for that matter. If there's someone that has a differing opinion on that, let us know, but uh, that, that's a good question because uh, Municipalities change their source of water. I was out in California last week, and our rep said, you know, with that low water table, one day you're pulling water, uh, municipal water is coming from an aqueduct, the next day it's coming from a river, and the next day it's coming from uh, an aquifer. So the quality of water changes by geography, but also can change by time, and thus municipalities are always trying to make the correct additives to comply at a minimum with the EPA standards, not to mention, in this case, aesthetic issues largely. Okay, good. And another question is, is um, demineralized water the same as DI water, deionized water? Uh, demineralized water and deionized water, um, it's one and the same. Because when you're referring to demineralizing, you're referring to getting rid of the minerals that dissolve in solution that form ions. And thus, another word is called deionizer. 
but it's a good question because it, they're used interchangeably. It's like my example about pH and alkalinity. Related, but they're different. Um, resin beads, like softeners, mixed resin beads, mixed media, is a very popular and as, uh, is this form of demineralizer that uh, Cleffy and other manufacturers here in North America use. But there also is, you can, just, you can use reverse osmosis, uh, which doesn't have quite as pure of a form of a result, but it probably perfectly fine for hydronic applications as well as distillation, but those typically are expensive. And they do demineralize and they do, as a result, deionize the same thing. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Another question, this is probably more of a question or a, a, your opinion on it. Um, could, could you fill a system with regular water and then hook up uh, hydrofill and then run the water through the hydrofill without turning on the boiler? And would this then cause, would not cause the uh, carbonic acid to form? And w would that be a better solution? Uh, that is a very good question. And I'm thinking about it. and and potentially an excellent solution, quite frankly, because first of all, you have a diagram here. This is basically filling the system with water, but you could just as easily uh, use your uh, demineralizer as a sidearm, if you will, and basically scrub that water of its minerals in solution and, and doing it in such a way that the, uh, uh, you don't get that uh, carbonic effect that you uh, talked about. Now, in that case, your resulting water pH will probably be around seven. So, if you started at even with the situation that you talked about, let's say you were at seven and a half, and you started demineralizing, you'd end up with seven, which is. Um, but you certainly wouldn't have the situation where carbonic acid would form. So that's that's actually a very good question. Perhaps a pr pretty good solution. Okay. <clears throat> Another question is. Um, how do you know when the demineralizer is exhausted and all the resin is exchanged? Oh, good question. The demineralizer will, well, that's a good shot of it right here. Well, maybe I can go to, yeah, let's just stay on that, I guess. Um, the demineralizer, basically in the case of the, well, let's say this demineralizer, the water goes up kind of uniformly through the column. There's diffusers down here that allow equal flow paths throughout the cross-section of the the, the resin bed, okay, and and so what happens is that until the demineralizer is spent, you'll read zero TDS at the discharge here. But once those beads start to get spent, then what happens is you'll start seeing your TDS start to rise. You might see two, three, five TDS or th uh, two, three, five parts per million. But then once they start getting spent, they they go up fairly rapidly. In our, I think in our instructions we suggest 30 as the cutoff, but quite frankly, the amount of time it would take to get from 30 to 100 and north of 100 would probably be pretty short. So we say 30 parts per million is a good place to start changing out your, your bed. Uh, another question, and maybe um, I don't know the answer to this. Um, do you have any recommendations on a good... Um, water quality tester, you know, you showed the picture of uh, the Kalefi, the electronic versus um, some other type of um, tester? Um, well, there is, uh, well, water quality, there's different things you can test, right? One of them is pH. So um, electronic is your most accurate form, um, but you can have pH strips that give you a pretty good approximation of pH. Uh, as a result, uh, as it re pertains to TDS, um, there are other methods of doing that. And in fact, within TDS, the specific form of calcium and magnesium hardness itself, and 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 not taking a look at all the other types of dissolved ions, there also is on the market uh, meters for doing that. I can't say I'm really too familiar with all of that. Perhaps some of our listeners still on can uh, weigh in on that with uh, your suggestions, but um, it's a good question. But uh, I think it's important, though, it's important to know how to use those meters because you can get an errant reading if you're not careful, just like anything, right? Uh, if you try to balance a balancing valve, if you're not careful about the instrumentation, you can get, uh, you know, if it's a, a delta P type of uh, 
balancing valve, you can get a, an errant result. Okay, another question. Uh, do water softeners remove iron? Uh, yes, they do, only in small concentrations. So if you have just a little bit of iron, um, they will remove it. There is a little bit of affinity between the, um, the sodium bead and the iron cation, uh, but as soon as you start increasing that concentration, they'll pass through and uh, resultingly into your into your hydronic system or into your water supply, uh, for example. Again, iron is not detrimental, it's just sometimes uh, problematic from an aesthetic standpoint. Now back to the water softener though, um, you, water softeners don't have their beads recycled. They, they, they basically recharge uh, when the beads are spent, and it's usually based on either a, a timing type process, but iron will tend to form on those beads and in the backwash process, the beginning of the process by which you recharge those beads with salt, then uh, they'll start clogging up those beads and the effectiveness of your water softener will be degraded. So better to use uh, 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 a green sand type of approach or or maybe even um, an oxidation approach where the iron when it's exposed to when it's oxidized will come out of solution in the form of a solid and it can be filtered off. In fact that's what some municipalities do instead of sequestering with a polyphosphate they'll actually uh, chlorinate or expose the water before it has a chance coming out of an aquifer to be exposed to air uh, they'll chlorinate it and filter it off but sometimes it's more expensive to do that than phosphate. So here's another question. I know this has come up before, but um, could you use the demineralizer on an existing system on a sidearm, like you discussed before, if the system has glycol in it, and what would happen to the glycol? That's a good question. I'm trying to think of the reactions of the glycol, uh, which can be, uh, uh, I'm going to say that that's going to be a problem. I think we've gotten that technical call too, and um, I think in order to try to um, improve a, pre a, a system that already has glycol mixed with mineralized water and using the demineralizer to straighten it out, um, I'm not sure if that's going to work very well. Yeah, Mark, I, I can make a comment on this. Um, and basically what happens is that the propylene glycol will pass right through, but what it does is typically in propylene glycol, the, the, they'll put inhibitors in it. Mm -hmm. And what it'll do, inhibitors are, are, again, types of minerals or salts, and they'll actually strip all the inhibitors out of the glycol, end up with pure glycol and demineralized water, but you lose any inhibitors that were added to the glycol by the glycol manufacturer. Ah, uh, okay. And then so, uh, resultingly, it could, uh, its properties can change pretty quickly as a result. When, it, when it's operating Correct. in the system. Okay, okay, good. And um, we'll see you on the next Coffee with Kalefi. Thanks, Rex. Thanks, Woody, for what you've done here with uh, the polling and the questions.